The Ninth State of the Union Address John Adams' First Annual Message to Congress November 22, 1797 Congress Hall, Philadelphia I was for some time apprehensive that it would be necessary, on account of the contagious sickness which afflicted the city of Philadelphia, to convene the national legislature at some other place. This measure it was desirable to avoid, because it would occasion much public inconvenience and a considerable public expense and add to the calamities of the inhabitants of this city, whose sufferings must have excited the sympathy of all their fellow citizens. Therefore, after taking measures to ascertain the state and decline of the sickness, I postponed my determination, having hopes, now happily realized, that without hazard to the lives or health of the members, Congress might assemble at this place, where it was next by law to meet. I submit, however, to your consideration whether a power to postpone the meeting of Congress without passing the time fixed by the Constitution upon such occasions would not be a useful amendment to the law of 1794. Although I cannot yet congratulate you on the re-establishment of peace in Europe and the restoration of security to the persons and properties of our citizens from injustice and violence at sea, we have, nevertheless, abundant cause of gratitude to the source of benevolence and influence for interior tranquility and personal security. For propitious seasons, prosperous agriculture, productive fisheries, and general improvements, and, above all, for a rational spirit of civil and religious liberty and a calm but steady determination to support our sovereignty as well as our moral and our religious principles against all open and secret attacks. Our envoys, extraordinary to the French Republic, embarked, one in July, the other in August, to join their colleague in Holland. I have received intelligence of the arrival of both of them in Holland, from whence they all proceeded on their journeys to Paris within a few days of the 19th of September. Whatever may be the result of this mission, I trust that nothing will have been omitted on my part to conduct the negotiation to a successful conclusion. On such equitable terms as as may be compatible with the safety, honor, and interest of the United States. Nothing, in the meantime, will contribute so much to the preservation of peace and the attainment of justice as manifestation of that energy and unanimity of which, on many former occasions, the people of the United States have given such memorable proofs and the exertion of those resources for national defense, which a beneficent providence has kindly placed within their power. It may be confidently asserted that nothing has occurred since the adjournment of Congress, which renders inexpedient those precautionary measures recommended by me to the consideration of the two houses at the opening of your late extraordinary session. If that system was then prudent, it is more so now, as increasing depredations strengthen the reasons for its adoption. Indeed, whatever may be the issue of the negotiation with France, and whether the war in Europe is or is not to continue, I hold it most certain that permanent tranquility and order will not soon be obtained. The state of society has so long been disturbed, the sense of moral and religious obligations so much weakened, public faith and national honor have been so impaired, respect to treaties has been so diminished, and the law of nations has lost so much of its force, while pride, avarice, and violence have been so long unrestrained. There remains no reasonable ground on which to raise an expectation that a commerce without protection or defense will not be plundered. The commerce of the United States is essential, if not to their existence, at least to their comfort, their growth, prosperity, and happiness. The genius character and habits of the people are highly commercial. Their cities have been formed and exist upon commerce. Our agriculture, fisheries, arts, and manufactures are connected with and depend on it. In short, commerce has made this country what it is, and it cannot be destroyed or neglected without involving the people in poverty and distress. 
Great numbers are directly and solely supported by navigation. The faith of society is pledged for the preservation of the rights of commercial and seafaring, no less than of the other citizens. Under this view of our affairs, I should hold myself guilty of neglect of duty if I forbore to recommend that we should make every exertion to protect our commerce and to place our country in a suitable posture of defense as the only sure means of preserving both. I have entertained an expectation that it would have been in my power at the opening of this session to have communicated to you the agreeable information of the due execution of our treaty with His Catholic Majesty respecting the withdrawing of his troops from our territory and the demarcation of the line of limits, but by the latest authentic intelligence, Spanish garrisons were still continued within our country and the running of the boundary line had not been commenced. These circumstances are the more to be regretted as they cannot fail to affect the Indians in a manner injurious to the United States. Still, however, indulging the hope that the answers which have been given will remove the objections offered by the Spanish officers to the immediate execution of the treaty. I have judged it proper that we should continue in readiness to receive the posts and to run the line of limits. Further information on this subject will be communicated in the course of the session. In connection with this unpleasant state of things on our western frontier, it is proper for me to mention the attempts of foreign agents to alienate the affections of the Indian nations and to excite them to actual hostilities against the United States. Great activity has been exerted by those persons who have insinuated themselves among the Indian tribes residing within the territory of the United States to influence them to transfer their affections and force to a foreign nation, to form them into a confederacy and prepare them for war against the United States. Although measures have been taken to counteract these infractions of our rights to prevent Indian hostilities and to preserve entire their attachment to the United States, it is my duty to observe that to give a better effect to these measures and to obviate the consequences of the repetition of such practices, a law providing adequate punishment for such offenses may be necessary. The commissioners appointed under the fifth article of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation between the United States and Great Britain to ascertain the river, which was truly intended under the name of the River St. Croix mentioned in the Treaty of Peace, met at Passamaquoddy Bay in 1796, and viewed the mouths of the rivers in question and the adjacent shores and islands and being of opinion that actual surveys of both rivers to their sources were necessary, gave to the agents of the two nations instructions for that purpose, and adjourned to meet at Boston in August. They met, but the surveys requiring more time than had been supposed, and not being completed, the commissioners again adjourned to meet at Providence in the state of Rhode Island in June next when we may expect a final examination and decision. The commissioners appointed in pursuance of the sixth article of the treaty met at Philadelphia in May last to examine the claims of British subjects for debts contracted before the peace and still remaining due to them from citizens or inhabitants of the United States. Various causes have hitherto prevented any determinations, but the business is now resumed, and doubtless will be prosecuted without interruption. Several decisions on the claims of citizens of the United States for losses and damages sustained by reason of irregular and illegal captures or condemnations of their vessels or other property have been made by the commissioners in London conformably to the seventh article of the treaty. The sums awarded by the commissioners have been paid by the British government. A considerable number of other claims, where costs and damages and not captured property were the only objects in question, have been decided by arbitration, and the sums awarded to the citizens of the United States have also been paid.
The commissioners appointed agreeably to the 21st article of our treaty with Spain met at Philadelphia in the summer past to examine and decide on the claims of our citizens for losses they have sustained in consequence of their vessels and cargoes having been taken by the subjects of His Catholic Majesty during the late war between Spain and France. Their sittings have been interrupted but are now resumed the United States being obligated to make compensation for the losses and damages sustained by British subjects upon the award of the commissioners acting under the sixth article of the treaty with Great Britain and for the losses and damages sustained by British subjects by reason of the capture of their vessels and merchandise taken within the limits and jurisdiction of the United States and brought into their ports or taken by vessels originally armed in ports of the United States upon the awards of the commissioners acting under the seventh article of the same treaty it is necessary that provision be made for fulfilling these obligations the numerous captures of american vessels by the cruisers of the french republic and of some by those of spain have occasioned considerable expenses in making and supporting the claims of our citizens before their tribunals the sums required for this purpose have in diverse instances been dispersed by the consuls of the united states by means of the same captures, great numbers of our seamen have been thrown ashore in foreign countries, destitute of all means of substance, and the sick in particular have been exposed to grievous sufferings. The consuls have in these cases also advanced monies for their relief. For these advances, they reasonably expect reimbursements from the United States. The Consular Act, relative to seamen, requires revision and amendment. The provisions for their support in foreign countries and for their return are found to be inadequate and ineffectual. Another provision seems necessary to be added to the Consular Act. Some foreign vessels have been discovered sailing under the flag of the United States and with forged papers. It seldom happens that the consuls can detect this deception, because they have no authority to demand an inspection of the registers and sea letters. Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, it is my duty to recommend to your serious consideration those objects which by the Constitution are placed particularly within your sphere, the national debt and taxes. Since the decay of the feudal system, by which the public defense was provided for chiefly at the expense of individuals, the system of loans has been introduced, and as no nation can arise within the year by taxes sufficient sums for its defense and military operations in time of war, the sums loaned and debts contracted have necessarily become the subjects of what have been called funding systems. The consequences arising from the continual accumulation of public debts in other countries ought to admonish us to be careful to prevent their growth in our own. The national defense must be provided for as well as the support of government, but both should be accomplished as much as possible by immediate taxes and as little as possible by loans. The estimates for the service of the ensuing year will, by my direction, be laid before you. Gentlemen of the Senate and Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, we are met together at a most interesting period. The situation of the principal powers of Europe are singular and portentous. Connected with some by treaties and with all by commerce, no important event can be indifferent to us. Such circumstances call with peculiar importunity, not less for a disposition to unite in all those measures on which the honor, safety, and prosperity of our country depend then for all the exertions of wisdom and firmness. In all such measures you may rely on my zealous and hearty concurrence. John Adams Senate Reply to John Adams from Jacob Reed November 28, 1797 Sir, the communications you thought proper to make in your speech to both Houses of Congress on the opening of their present session afford additional proofs of the attention, integrity, and firmness which have always marked your official character. 
We cannot but approve of the measures you had taken to ascertain the state and decline of the contagious sickness, which has so lately afflicted the city of Philadelphia, and the pleasing circumstances that Congress is now assembled at that place, without hazard to the health of its members, evinces the propriety of your having postponed a determination to convey the national legislature at another place. We shall take into consideration the law of 1794 on this subject, and will readily concur in any amendment which may be deemed expedient. It would have given us much pleasure to have received your congratulations on the re-establishment of peace in Europe, and the restoration of security to the persons and property of your citizens from injustice and violence at sea. But though these events, so desirable to our country and the world, have not taken place yet, we have abundant cause of gratitude to the great disposer of human events for interior tranquility and personal security for propitious seasons, prosperous agriculture, productive fisheries, and general improvement, and, above all, for the rational spirit of civil and religious liberty and a calm but steady determination to support our sovereignty against all open and secret attacks. We learn with satisfaction that our envoys extraordinary to the French Republic had safely arrived in Europe and were proceeding to the scene of negotiation. And whatever may be the result of the mission, we are perfectly satisfied that nothing on your part has been omitted, which could in any way conduce to a successful conclusion of the negotiation upon terms compatible with the safety, honor, and interest of the United States. And we are fully convinced that in the meantime, a manifestation of that unanimity and energy of which the people of the United States have given such memorable proofs and a proper exertion of those resources of national defense, which we possess will essentially contribute to the preservation of peace and the attainment of justice. We think, sir, with you that the commerce of the United States is essential to the growth, comfort, and prosperity of our country, and that the faith of society is pledged for the preservation of the rights of commercial and seafaring no less than of other citizens. And even if our negotiation with France should terminate favorably and the war in Europe cease, yet the state of society which unhappily prevails in so great a portion of the world and the experience of past times under better circumstances unite in warning us that a commerce so extensive and which holds out so many temptations to lawless plunders can never be safe without protection, and we hold ourselves obliged by every tie of duty which binds us to our constituents to promote and concur in such measures of marine defense, as may convince our merchants and seamen that their rights are not sacrificed, nor their injuries forgotten. We regret that, notwithstanding, the clear and explicit terms of the treaty between the United States and His Catholic Majesty, the Spanish garrisons are not yet withdrawn from our territory, nor the running of the boundary line commenced. The United States have been faithful in the performance of their obligations to Spain, and had reason to expect a compliance equally prompt on the part of that power. We still, however, indulge the hope that the convincing answers which have been given to the objections stated by the Spanish officers to the immediate execution of the treaty will have their proper effect, and that this treaty, so mutually beneficial to the contracting parties, will be finally observed with good faith. We therefore entirely approve of your determination to continue in readiness to receive the posts and to run the lines of partition between our territory and that of the King of Spain. Attempts to alienate the affections of the Indians, to form them into a confederacy, and to excite them to actual hostility against the United States, whether made by foreign agents or by others, are so injurious to our interests at large, and so inhuman with respect to our citizens inhabiting the adjacent territory, as to deserve the most exemplary punishment, and we will cheerfully afford our aid in framing a law which may prescribe a punishment adequate to the mission of crimes so heinous. To the several objects you have pointed out, 
to the attention of the legislature whether they regard our internal or external relations shall receive from us that consideration which they merit and we will readily concur in all such measures as may be necessary either to enable us to fulfill our engagements at home or to cause ourselves to be respected abroad and at this portentous period when the powers of europe with whom we are connected by treaty or commerce are in so critical a situation and when the conduct of some of those powers towards the united states is so hostile and menacing the several branches of the government are in our opinion called upon with peculiar importunity to unite and by union not only to devise and carry into effect those measures on which the safety and prosperity of our country depend but to also undeceive those nations who regarding us as a weak and divided people have pursued systems of aggression inconsistent with a state of peace between independent nations and sir we beg leave to assure you that we derive a singular consolation from the reflection that in such a time the executive part of our government has been committed to your hands for in your integrity talents and firmness we place the most entire confidence jacob reed President of the Senate Pro Tempore. House Reply to John Adams, November 29th, 1797. Sir, while our sympathy is excited by the recent sufferings of the citizens of Philadelphia, we participate in the satisfaction which you are pleased to express. That the duration of the late calamity was so limited as to render unnecessary the expense and inconvenience that would have been incident to the convention of congress in another place and we shall readily attend to every useful amendment to the law which contemplates the event of contagious sickness at the seat of government in lamenting the increase of the injuries offered to the persons and property of our citizens at sea we gratefully acknowledge the continuance of interior tranquillity and the attendant blessings of which you remind us as alleviations of these fatal effects of injustice and violence whatever may be the result of the mission to the french republic your early and uniform attachment to the interest of our country your important services in the struggle for its independence and your unceasing exertions for its welfare afford no room to doubt of the sincerity of your efforts to conduct the negotiation to a successful conclusion on such terms as may be compatible with the safety honor and interest of the united states we have also a firm reliance upon the energy of unanimity of the people of these states in the assertion of their rights and on their determination to exert upon all proper occasions their ample resources in providing for the national defense the importance of commerce and its beneficial influence upon agriculture arts and manufactures have been verified in the growth and prosperity of our country it is essentially connected with the other great interests of the community they must flourish and decline together while the extension of our navigation and trade naturally excites the jealousy and tempts the avarice of other nations we are firmly persuaded that the numerous and deserving class of citizens engaged in these pursuants and dependent on them for their subsistence has a strong and indisputable claim to our support and protection the delay of the spanish officers to fulfill the treaty existing with his catholic majesty is a source of deep regret we learn however with satisfaction that you still indulge hopes of removing the objections which have been made to its execution and that you have continued in readiness to receive the posts disposed to perform with fidelity our national engagements nothing shall be wanting on our part to obtain the same justice from others which we exercise towards them our abhorrence cannot be too strongly expressed of the intrigues of foreign agents to alienate the affections of the indians and to rouse them to acts of hostility against the united states no means in our power should be omitted of providing for the suppression of such cruel practices 
and for the adequate punishment of their atrocities, and for the adequate punishment of their atrocious authors. Upon the other interesting subjects noticed in your address, we shall bestow the requisite attention to preserve inviolable the public faith by providing for the due execution of our treaties to indemnify those who may have just claims to retribution upon the United States for expenses incurred in defending the property and relieving the necessities of our unfortunate fellow citizens to guard against evasions of the laws intended to secure advantages to the navigation of our own vessels and especially to prevent by all possible means an unnecessary accumulation of the public debt are duties which we shall endeavor to keep in view and discharge with assiduity we regard with great anxiety the singular and portentous situation of the principal powers of europe it were devoutly to be wished that the united states remote from this seat of war and discord unambitious of conquests respecting the rights of other nations and desirous merely to avail themselves of their natural resources might be permitted to behold the scenes which desolate that quarter of the globe with only those sympathetic emotions which are natural to the lovers of peace and friends of the human race we are led by events to associate with these feelings a sense of the dangers which menace our security and peace we rely upon your assurances of a zealous and hearty concurrence in such measures as may be necessary to avert these dangers and nothing on our part shall be wanting to repel them which the honor safety and prosperity of our country may require Thank you for listening to the ninth State of the Union Address, John Adams's first annual message to Congress. Please support the channel in whichever way you can, and there's lots of ways you can. You can like, share, subscribe, hit the notification button, become a member on our website, www.amendingamerica.us, join our Discord, become a Patreon member, donate to our GoFundMe page and anything else which may help promote the channel and develop our community. Thanks again for watching, and see you next time.